I was uh, converted when I was about 21. I uh, had uh, I was asked to leave high school early because of uh, uh, my uh, fighting every day almost. Got my diploma early. If I had promised not to come back to school after Christmas, <laughs> moved to Riverside, California. We were living in the Indio, California, Southern California. We went to I went to Riverside, California, and uh, uh, fell in with some friends, and we were in, rented an apartment together, and and uh, we had I had, had all kinds of difficulties. I burglarized homes and so forth, and. I uh, started going to junior college and uh, uh, came in intoxicated one night. I had a problem with drinking. A young man uh, who he and five other Christians had been praying for me. They, for re they were reluctant to share the gospel with me, I guess because they were afraid that I would, or thinking I wouldn't listen. But they, uh, he, he, I, Two o'clock in the morning, I was trying to find my room. He heard the noise out in the hallway. He was studying for exams the next day. And uh, I wasn't studying because I was failing all my courses anyway. So uh, he opened the door to see what the noise was in the hallway, and he saw me. And uh, I was uh, drunk. And I was different from my brothers. When my brothers were drunk, they were violent. But when I was intoxicated, I loved everybody. And uh, he said, hey, Doug, would you, uh, I was smiling, so he said, hey, Doug, would you like a cup of coffee? I said, sure. I like coffee. I went into his room. He gave me a cup of coffee and shared the gospel. Coffee and gospel, coffee, gospel. About 4.30 or 5 in the morning, I was full of coffee, but I understood the gospel. I was sober, fell on my knees, and professed Christ as Savior. He forgave me of my sins. I went to my room, fell asleep. Woke up the next morning, uh, later morning, and I was a new creature in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. Went down to a, a Baptist bookstore and bought me a Thompson chain reference King James Version Bible. It was so big that if I dropped it, I'd probably broke my foot. And I uh, began to read. Now, usually new believers will read uh, the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or some of the epistles. I began to read in Romans, and it was very difficult for me to understand. You know, Romans 1 was good, Romans 2 and 3, very good. Then you got to 4 and 5, 6, 7, 9, getting a little difficult. <laughs> but I read uh, in Romans that... Uh, that uh, to owe no man anything but the love. I owed everybody in town. And that was the first verse that convicted me of the sin of stealing. I was a thief. And I owed so much. I had gambling debts, but I'd robbed homes. I'd burglarized homes. And I remember that God uh, convicted me of my sin of, uh, of covetousness, of of thievery, of stealing, so I began to pay my debts. And it took it took a while. But during that year during that year I was paying my debts, this fellow who led me to Christ, it was the end of the school year, he had uh, he he went to a Bible school in Canada, Prairie Bible Institute. And he began to write me. He said, Doug, you ought to come up here, you ought to get away from that. Lifestyle in California, I I was engaged to be married and and uh, I broke that engagement, and uh, he said, you ought to come to Prairie, get in the Word of God. So I paid my debts. It took a year. I had to get two jobs, and uh, paid all. The Lord, by God's grace, I was able to pay my debts. I uh, saved $350 for the one-year tuition at Prairie Bible Institute. Can you believe that? One-year tuition. Shows you how old we are. I am. To have a whole room board and tuition for one year, three hundred, three hundred fifty dollars, and about fifty dollars to get all the way to Canada by Greyhound bus, and went to Prairie. Well, my background is very, very different from Doug's. Growing up in a 
missionary family. So right from the very start, I heard the gospel and I knew the gospel. But it wasn't until I was eight years old that it really, I, it, I really understood it and I realized that I needed a savior. I was attending a VBS because at that point my folks had been moved down to um, Seattle um, to be the mission representative for Overseas Missionary Fellowship and we had lived in what would be a mission home which took care of missionaries coming and going um, to and from Asia. Um, so one of mom's and dad's job was to take care of these missionaries and daddy spoke at a lot of missions conferences but there we were attending a little church near us and as I went to VBS that summer I all of a sudden realized that I was a sinner in need of a savior and I remember going home that day after VBS walking home and we lived on a very busy street and I remember being very afraid that I wouldn't make it home to talk to my mother about the decision I knew I needed to make and I walked really close to a, a wall that was away from the street because I didn't want to get hit by a car. Um, I mean that that's, seems rather silly in some ways but when I got home I waited until that evening and I guess my mother knew something was wrong with me, something was troubling me and when she asked me what my concerns were, what was bothering me, I told her that I needed to ask Jesus into my life. I needed to give my, him, my life to Him, that I was a sinner and that I needed a Savior. And so she prayed with me that night. We knelt down by my bed and, and I gave my life to the Lord, um, trusting Him as my Savior from sin. And so I remember after that right away having a real desire to read God's Word and I loved the smell of my Bible, the pages and, and um, even as a child um, I began reading it and it became very precious to me and has become very precious to me over the years. You know, God has really worked in our lives over the years. It's by God's grace. We have a friend at our church, Ebenezer Solomon, that always uses the phrase, uh, by God's grace. How are, you, how are you doing, Solomon? Oh, by God's grace, I'm doing well. And we live by God's grace, even in difficult times. And uh, when I when uh, I graduated from Prairie, uh, I'd, we had, I'd applied to about 30 different missions, but nobody would accept me because of my background and abilities. Finally, I applied to Operation Mobilization. In those days, they accepted anybody. And I was supposed to go to France. France has uh, 12,000 villages with no gospel witness. And I wanted to go to, go to one village every two days, and then another village for two days, another village for two days, and had it all mapped out. But uh, at a conference with OM, a kind of an orientation conference in England before they assigned you to a certain country. There were 300 of us, and uh, we, uh, they had an all-night prayer meeting for India. And I thought, well, I, I, I didn't know what an all-night prayer meeting was. I went to an all-night prayer meeting, and, and uh, they're supposed to be praying for other countries, but they, they, uh, they mainly majored on India. They were major concerned of some of the leaders of OM, George Brewer and others. And uh, I, I, all of a sudden, I just got a real burden for, for, uh, for India because of the masses of people without Christ. Uh, they did not take too many people for India, but I applied. And uh, they said, well, you can go if you learn to drive one of the big trucks. So I, they took me out, taught me how to drive one of these lorries. That's a truck, a big uh, truck. And uh, so I became a driver. And they accepted me for India, but you, you went, had to go for two years. Now, Margaret and I had become engaged. And that meant two years away from her instead of the one year 
that I expected to be with OM for, for one year. And uh, we prayed about it and uh, went to India for two years. And, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a milestone, but I wanted to preach. I wanted to learn how to preach. And we did a lot of preaching in the open air. But what happened, I began to preach in the open air and I began to cough a lot. And it was so bad that I would give a sentence and while someone was interpreting, translating, I'd cough. And I would say a sentence, cough, interpretation, so forth. And they took me to a doctor and they became very concerned because they found I had tuberculosis. So here I wanted to do this and God gives me sickness. End up in a TB sanatorium. They didn't take me in a TB sanatorium at first because I was an Americano, it's white. You know, white people always have a lot of money and they didn't know I was broke, I was, had less money than they did. Somebody died uh, that day in the hospital and they let me have his bed. They didn't even change the sheets. So here I was in a uh, tuberculosis sanatorium and that was a wonderful experience. Terrible, but wonderful. God's grace used that to help help me in my growth in the Lord, to know Him, to depend upon Him. We, live, we say we live by faith, not by feelings, but is that true? Many times we base our decisions on how we feel. We're comfortable, uh, we feel good about this, we, we sense the presence of whatever, and yet uh, we're living by feelings, not by faith. God tells us to do something, but we walk ahead by, and we, we don't obey. So here I'm in a TV sanatorium, and that's where God had me. And I, as well, George Verver came to visit me, gave me a box, <laughs> box of gospel literature to distribute to the other patients. And I would go to the other patients and start giving them a track, and they'd tear it up and throw it in my face. Why? Because they didn't like me, because I was taking the place of an Indian. Why was I in in a hospital with Indians taking their place and uh, I should be in a nice hospital. And they did not like me, they did not accept my gospel literature at all. But see, God was in control of this. Because one night I woke up because of uh, coughing so much, about two in the morning, woke up coughing, and this, uh, I noticed across the aisle, across on the other side of the ward, a man was trying to get out of bed. He would get out of bed, and he would so weak he'd fall back in. Get out of bed, fall back in. I didn't know what was happening. Uh, finally, he just fell back in bed, began to cry. I thought, well, I didn't know what's going on. So the next morning, I knew what had happened. Because of the stench, he was simply trying to get up out of bed to go to the toilet. But he was so weak, he couldn't do it. Uh, the nurses came in to change the bedding, and they were mad at him. One of them hit him in the top of the head, and... Other patients were upset and because of the smell, the stench of the ward, and it was a terrible situation. The problem was the next night at 2 o'clock, I woke up coughing again, looked across the aisle, the ward, and he was trying to get out of bed again. Same thing. Now I knew what was happening. And yet, I began to reason why it wasn't my responsibility to do anything. I mean, I... They didn't like me. Uh, number two, uh, was it proper to do to for to take another man to the toilet? Uh, oh, where were the doctors and nurses? They're the ones responsible. What about other patients who are Indians? Let the have you heard the phrase, "Let the nationals take care of themselves." You hear that a lot, but nobody do anything. And uh, finally, I realized that, uh, you know, I remember the verse in James. I didn't memorize a lot, but I remember that verse. He that knows the right thing to do and does not do it to him, it is sin. So uh, reluctantly, I got out of bed, walked across to where he was. He had given up trying to get out of bed, and he was crying. Had his eyes closed. I tapped him on the shoulder. He looked up and in fear, he saw me, but before he could say anything, I just reached down and picked him up. Uh, he was skin and bones. Now, I was, I was sick with TB, but I was a lot more healthy than he was. Picked him up, carried him down the, down the hallway, around the corner to this filthy toilet, 
held him while he relieved himself and uh, didn't enjoy it a bit. Did not enjoy it a bit. When he finished, I picked him up, carried him back to his bed, and when I laid him down on the bed, my face was down near his, and he kissed me right here on the cheek. Said something in Malayalam, Indian language, I didn't understand. Probably thank you. And exhausted, I went back to my bed and fell on, you know, went to, went to sleep. The next morning, it was really interesting. A man woke me up about 5, 5.30 as the sun was coming up, and he had a cup of special Indian chai. Not cheap stuff, a special with a bone china cup, hand me a mug hand me a cup of tea. Now, isn't that, that interesting? A few days before, they're tearing up my tracks, they're not talking to me and everything. Now I'm getting breakfast in bed. Give me a, gave me a cup of tea, and I sat up, and I thanked them, and said, uh, you know, and, and we couldn't communicate, didn't know the language, and he began to motion to me. He began to go like this, go like this, you know. In other words, I, and I understood he, he wanted a gospel booklet. So I reached into the bed. I was so excited. I gave him a, a booklet, the Gospel of John, and uh, and he, he he bowed and thanked me. And it's very interesting that he walked away, and I couldn't believe this. Why did that happen? Pretty soon, another man came, and asked for a literature. Another man came. Another man came. Pretty soon, one of those mean nurses, the doctors, and over the process of that day or the next day. 300 patients came to my bed or sent someone to ask for literature. Now, what caused that? Me standing on a corner and preaching, sacrificing, building a hospital uh, to, uh, to uh, mop the... F what, what, what was it that caused such an interest in people coming to me and asking for a gospel booklet? All I did was take a man to the toilet. Anybody could do that. Well, my parents, of course, had a huge impact on me in growing up in a missionary family. It was really a privilege because I saw every day mom and dad trusting the Lord for our needs because we were on a very, very, <laughs> very tight budget. But God always provided and, and took care of us. So that was, a, that was a wonderful thing. And just to see how my parents interacted with other people too was was a real example to me daddy is concerned daddy was very quiet but a very wise man he knew the scriptures mom um, very outgoing and very hospitable in taking care of people that came into our home and it was wonderful growing up in a home where we had so many missionaries all the time because we always had guests people coming and going from Asia. <clears throat> so around the table, we had long conversations. And we kids, we were five, would really enjoy sitting there listening to the conversations, the stories um, about the experiences these missionaries had had, of what God was doing in other parts of the world, particularly in Asia. So this had a huge impact on us. And then we went to, uh, as I got older, we went to uh, church that had a wonderful um, young people's director and he had a great impression on me. I was extremely shy um, and what Bill Pearson made us do as young people was to um, take part. He would help us. We had to prepare little talks, little Bible messages, devotionals to give at young people's, remember that. That was so scary for me, so scary. But he was there to help us to do it. And he encouraged us, made us <laughs> take our turn to do it. And then we had a choir, we had to sing. And, and so all of those things were so helpful. But then I went to Bible school up to Prairie. And um, that also was scary in that I was by myself away from family um, 
and I was very shy and always used to saying when I was asked to do anything, um, oh, I can't, I can't. Well, that was, <clears throat> at Bible school, was one place where God really dealt with me about my attitude, saying, I can't. Um, and it was through a verse of scripture in Exodus that said, if God command thee so, then thou shalt be able. It's just a little phrase, and it's probably out of context, I don't know. But that was a little phrase that God used in King James English that, that God used to help me to not always say, I can't, I can't. And um, so those things growing up. And then God gave me a wonderful husband who didn't let me wiggle out of things either because he was out very outgoing. Um, that really helped me a, a huge lot. I mean, it helped me a lot um, to not just give in to um, my, my natural reaction and response to things, help pull me out of my introvertiveness, if that's such a word. But um, so I'm very thankful to that through the years that Doug has been there to encourage and help me um, in that. But when I was very young and so shy, I remember my mom used to always send my second sister with me, who was very brave and outgoing. So Carol, who is now a missionary in Latin America, in Chile, um, she would always go with me everywhere and take care of her big sister. Uh, she, we were about the same size, so <laughs> she was very brave. She'd go to camp with me or <laughs> wherever it was. So whether that was good or bad, I don't know. <laughs> but it helped me through my growing up years. And then God um, dealt with me and helped me. And I like the verse in Psalm 46.1, which says, God is a very present help in trouble. And I've learned that he is indeed a, a real help to me in these times when I'm scared. I tend to be a, a fearful person, but he's there to help me. Well, I'm glad she, she did say I will one time <laughs> <laughs> when, when I asked her to marry me. And uh, in fact, but however, when we got married, uh, she had the flu and uh, we had a large wedding. We had about 300 people there at West Miniature Chapel in Bellevue. Washington, and uh, she was not well at all. And so when they were giving our vows to each other, she said, instead of saying, I, Margaret, take the Douglas to be my, she said, I, Douglas, <laughs> and take the Margaret <laughs> to be my <laughs> whatever. You know? And so, but I'm glad. And when I saw her, you know, when she at Prairie Bible Institute, she was singing a lot. She was a soloist, singing a trio, singing the choirs. And uh, when I first began to notice her, it was because she was singing. And when I really noticed her was Christmas program, when the choir, you know, a huge choir, singing. We had, you know, a huge concert, uh, you know, 4,000 people who just packed the auditorium and huge choir and orchestra, and they were singing uh, Oh Holy Night, beautiful, my favorite Christmas song. And she stepped forward and sang the solo part. And I thought an angel had come down from heaven. <laughs> In fact, I like to say that I said to the Lord, God, I don't deserve a wife, but if you do give me one, I want that one right there. <laughs> And we met that next summer at a Bible camp. And we began to work together and God brought us together. And I couldn't believe uh, after knowing her for several years and I asked her to marry me, she said yes. And uh, it's been 50 years ago. It's been an adventure, and never a dull moment. <laughs> been an adventure. <laughs>